encourage you uh, this morning to uh, begin to get your elements ready as we uh, will be taking communion this morning. So we encourage you to get your elements together. We want to welcome you and thank you for joining us. I also want to encourage you that um, there should be a, a button, <laughs> and it may not be on, on certain platforms, certain phones, but there should be a button that allows you to get a notification when we go live. And if you go ahead and click that button, then uh, it will send you a little notification the moment we go live. That will help you in the future to be able to connect with us as we gather together online to worship the Lord. I want to thank you for taking the opportunity and time to join us. We appreciate you. We miss you. Uh, the other night we had a small gathering outside, which was uh, nice and it was good. Uh, with social distancing, which is sometimes hard, we tried to uh, just gather in one place with a few of uh, the church people. And it was uh, a renewing of, of our commitments to God and our commitments to each other. This is a, a time of challenge, but we're thanking the Lord every day for the opportunity to meet the challenge and with the grace and the glory of God to be able to overcome that challenge. As I said, I want you to look for that notification button Press it so that you'll be notified the next time we go live. I'd like you also to do something that uh, uh, you may not uh, do very much. Just comment and say hello to us. Just say hi, good morning, bless you, something. By doing that, it lets us know that you're kind of checking in and uh, you're you're joining us and, and then we can kind of make note of the fact that you were with us. I want to also encourage you to share. Wednesday was one of the highest watched programs we've had ever. Uh, just in one, just in one few minutes, we had over 300 views. And that was because people were liking and sharing it and commenting about it. So I think we had 40 comments, something like that. But please like, share, and comment. And don't forget to click that notification button. We want to encourage you to get your communion elements ready. And as I've said before, it does not matter specifically what it is. If you have some juice, uh, apple juice will be fine, any kind of juice and uh, some bread or cracker that you can join us and take communion with us. I want to begin this morning by praying for a few things, so would you join me in prayer? Lord, we come to you now in prayer. We honor you and lift up your holy name, thanking you, Lord, for your blessings, both for us, on us, and to us. Lord God, we are grateful for your manifestations that accompany our lives daily, and we thank you for them, and we desire even more of them, Lord. Lord, we uh, thank you that you brought Sister Lopez through the surgery the other day and that she's doing better and well. We just continue to pray that you will uh, completely heal her and restore her back to 100%, Lord. We pray for Brother Gordon, Lord, who will be going into surgery soon. 
We ask the Lord that they'll find the right physician, they'll find the right team, that they'll be able to do his surgery, and Lord, he will be able to be healed as well. We pray, Lord, for little Lee who was bitten the other day by the ants. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you remove any poison from his body, that you'll help the, uh, the stinging and the, just the aggravation of the bites, that you'll just heal them and deliver them. And help him, Lord, to feel better in Jesus' name, Lord. We pray for those that are fighting against cancer, Lord, this morning. We ask that you'd give them strength and you'd help them to overcome this struggle, this battle. Give them victory. Lord, we proclaim victory over all that are struggling this morning, Lord. We pray for those that are uh, struggling with COVID, that you would heal their bodies, Lord, and recover them and restore them. Lord, I thank you for the good testimonies that I've heard of some people who have already been delivered, Lord, and are now back with their families. We praise God for the ability, Lord, for them to be healed. We just thank you, Lord. We give you the honor and praise. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can save us, can heal us, can wash us white as snow. And we just receive that blood and apply it to our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you have been following along with us, you know that we have been going through um, 1 Corinthians. We took a little bit of a break last week uh, because it was Memorial Sunday, and I encourage you, if you have not watched last Sunday's service, that you find it. Uh, I believe it's on my page, my personal page, uh, under videos. And I just encourage you to watch that. We, uh, we honor those who had passed away in this past year, all those that uh, had asked uh, to be included. And I would also encourage you that, you know, if you have a family member that you would like to be remembered and honored, please send us a picture of them and we will include them in our future videos. This morning I'm going to go to the book of Corinthians, the first book of Corinthians, chapter 8. I'm going to begin talking this morning about love over right. Some of you may know that in 2012, Mayor Bloomberg of New York announced that he was going to ban the sale of all sugar beverages larger than 16 ounces. He believed it would be a step forward to reducing the rate of obesity in his city and that it would help to, over, uh, to improve the overall health of all New Yorkers. The ban, he said, would apply to both bottled sodas and fountain drinks containing more than 25% calories per 8 ounces. That would mean that the city's 20,000 restaurants, coffee shops, food carts, theaters, stadiums, all would no longer be able to sell any of the empty calories in supersized portions. The New York Supreme Court ultimately struck down the mayor's plan, calling it arbitrary and capricious. But not before Mayor Bloomberg's big gulp ban plan became a punchline on all the talk shows and comedies, and even the mayor became a subject of ridicule. Bloomberg had identified a real problem and had a strong conviction about how to solve it, and he believed he had the authority to make that option law. He may have been right about that problem, totally right about it. He may have even had the authority to do it. 
But just because you're right and just because you have the authority doesn't mean that you're going to always be on the right side or even that you should even do it. In 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, Paul faces the same subject. He faces the same problem. He is answering a question for the first, or for the Corinthians there in 1 Corinthians 8. I'm going to go there to read it. I'll read a, a few verses here. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. Someone said the other day, does anybody read out of Bibles anymore? <laughs> Most people now just read it off their phone. So whichever way you do it is fine. Some of us still have our old faithful. But in verse 1 of chapter 8, he says, Now concerning things offered to idols... We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known of him. Most all of the responses here in Corinthians are responses to questions that the Corinthians asked him. As I was meditating on the scripture, I asked myself, how can this apply to us today? And I hope that with the Lord's help, I'll be able to show you how this does apply to our lives and to our situation. But we need to understand just a little bit about what was going on with them. This is a controversy in Corinth. Most of the Corinth people had come out of paganism. They had converted from paganism to Christianity or to, to being a follower of Christ. There were a lot of idols in the city of Corinth. It was a place where people worshipped uh, every god you could imagine. And the Corinthians were divided over the issue of whether it was okay to eat meat that had been sacrificed to idols. One group believed the spirits of pagan gods were absorbed into the meat that had been sacrificed to an idol and that Christians could be possessed by the demons if they ate that meat. Other groups who had formerly been involved in pagan worship didn't believe you could actually be possessed with anything, but still didn't want to do anything that reminded them of what it was like to worship before they came to Christ. They didn't want to be rem reminded of that. And the third group understand, understood that an idol was just a block of wood or a stone and had no power over them all, at all. Nothing could happen to you if you ate it. Of these three groups, Paul was probably a part of the third group. He probably understood and believed that it was just a block of wood or just stone and it couldn't have any effect on you at all. Since it was not real, since it was not alive, since it was something that was made up by man, it couldn't do anything to you. Nothing to fear, in other words. As a Jew, he didn't have a pagan past. He didn't have something of the past life that had reminded him of anything that he couldn't eat like that. Because you see, he had only worshipped all of his life the one true God. In fact, whenever Paul would eat meat, he would just simply bless it and thank God for providing it. He, as the apostle, could have pressed the point and said that eating meat sacrificed to idols is nothing, so just get over it. Grow up. He could have done that. 
He might have even argued that they should eat meat as a sign to the pagans that Christ was stronger than any false god. But instead, Paul decided to introduce a principle rather than the topic. So in verse 1, he goes on, now about food sacrificed to idols, and then he takes a turn. And he says, we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up, but love edifies or builds up. Paul says, let's not focus on the idols. Let's not focus on the meat. Let's not focus on the practice, but let's focus on love. Think about this for a minute. It could be any of the things that we have in our life today that we could be divided over. We could have anything that would happen to us today that because we have a little knowledge about it, we could be puffed up and we could think we know more than others that we have a better understanding of it than others. And we could take a side that looks down on people who aren't knowledgeable or who are not as informed. Think about what the Corinthians knew, that the idols had no power. Do you think that they might have looked at their other brothers and sisters and said, what in the world is wrong with you? Why don't you just wake up? Why don't you come to the realization that there's nothing to that? And how can we apply that to us today? And that's what I want to look at just for a minute. How we apply it to us. Every year about this time, Halloween comes around. <coughs> Excuse me. And some say that they know that there's nothing wrong with trick-or-treating. They know it. But others say, no, you can't do it at all. And those two groups look down on each other for somehow not having enough understanding. And so Halloween itself can even divide people. Some people think it's okay to uh, play Texas Hold'em, to gamble. However, there are other people that have problems with gambling. They're addicted to it. And they can't be around it or participated in it, in it at all without being drawn in to some kind of habit that does not help them. Some people don't like washing their cars on Sunday, so they look down the nose at others who might wash their cars on Sunday. Some people will look down their nose at people that watch rated R movies. We need to ask ourselves, how do we respond to others who have different feelings, different opinions, different views, or different convictions? There are, by, there are uh, sp specific things in the Bible that the Bible condemns. Extramarital sex, murder, theft, and so on. But there are other areas where there are not anything specifically said about it. And we're allowed the freedom in Christ to do as we are led. Because Christ didn't define every area and Christ didn't address every area. And some sincere believing Christians can be divided over it. Here we are. Who will be the next president? Are we going to be divided? Are we going to allow this situation to divide us? 
for us to begin to say, well, the people that voted for this person or the people that voted for this person or the people that were not smart enough to vote for this person or they didn't have enough understanding and they voted for the wrong person. We can be sucked in just like the Corinthians and begin condemning and looking down at people, even brothers and sisters in Christ, who didn't vote a certain way. And let me say this to you. Christ would not be pleased. He would not be happy with us. We must ask ourselves this question over and over and over again about all these issues, and especially in this particular season of time. Am I responding with what I know, with my knowledge, with my understanding? Or am I responding in love? I know a particular minister who made some statements on the internet before the election and because his statements were controversial or took a different position, he received a lot of heat from other Christians. And as I read through it, I thought to myself, this is exactly what the Apostle Paul is talking about. Other Christians have different views about this. They look at it completely different. And instead of responding to the brother with love, they're trying to set him straight. How often have we, we done that? How often have we tried to, to, to make sure that a person... Who, who we felt were on the wrong road, we need, to, we need to get them straight. I think it's important for us to remember that sometimes when the most important thing in our heart or mind at the time is to get somebody straight, that we can do that without love. We can do that without showing love. And we can actually alienate that person or we can actually hurt that person so deeply that even though we do love them and they might finally discover that we love them, they still remember that we did that to them. And they still carry the memory of how it felt to be treated that way by a brother or a sister. Am I saying it's okay to do certain things and act and, and act certain ways? No, I'm not. I'm not saying that at all. That's why I'm saying we need to be careful that whatever we do is wrapped up in love so that the person or persons feel love rather than feel the rebuke. There are times to rebuke things. There are times to rebuke people. Especially when the scriptures are explicit about it. But then there are many, many other things that are just not addressed or not clear. And we can't go to war over those things. Do you realize? Have you stopped to think about it? How many denominations, how many separated churches we have in America simply because somebody said that we're not going to have a, a red carpet, we're going to have blue carpet. And if we don't have blue carpet, we're all leaving and taking our family with us. And you cannot in any way convince me that the actions of those believers were inspired by God himself. They were not. They were inspired by God up. So we need to be careful. At the very end of this scripture, Paul tries to make a serious point. He tries to help us to understand that we're in Christ, we're in God, that everybody that's a Christian should know that. Everybody should know that Christ is the one who lives in us and through us. He's the guiding principle. 
But some people are not completely aware of that, meaning the unbelievers. And the unbelievers are watching us to see how we live in community. And since we live our lives through Christ, what we eat won't bring us any closer to Christ and surely won't pull us further away because we're in Christ. And that needs to be our clearest understanding is that I'm in Christ. That these are not important in fact, in some cases, they might be very important. But Paul puts one truth about people forward, right in the smack of all of this. Christ needs to be supreme. He needs to be most important, no matter what. When somebody does not know Christ, they have no relationship with Christ. They don't understand the securing position of Christ. They don't understand the relationship and the satisfaction that comes from knowing Jesus. And then they see how Christians who claim to have that security in Christ, that knowledge of Christ, get puffed up and treat one another. They look at that, and I'm sure you've heard it, if that's Christianity, I don't want none of that. I don't want no part of that. If that's the way Christians act, I don't want that. So you see, it's not so much about what we do or do not do, or whether it's right or wrong, but it's how we treat one another that's most important. How we respond to those differences that we might have. And we're always going to have differences as long as we're here on this earth. We're always going to view things a little bit differently. So Paul goes on from verse 9 to 13, and he explains that we should not exercise our freedom at the expense of others. It isn't about somebody thinking less of us because of what we're doing. It's about others thinking less of Christ who we're supposed to be exampling for the world. If they look at us, do they see Christ? Or do they see bickering children arguing over things that they might feel are trivial and silly? Remember I said earlier, it's okay to play Texas Hold'em. But would you f refrain from, from playing it in order to help a brother or sister who is struggling with gambling? Would you allow the, the Spirit of Christ to come through you and maybe say, you know, I know it's okay, I can do that. This is what Paul is saying. I can eat, I can eat meat, it ain't gonna hurt me because it's nothing. But he's saying, if I have brothers and sisters in Corinth, that somehow that would cause them to stumble or maybe even turn their back on, on God, or if there are others in Corinth that are not even believers, I'm, and I go out there and just start eating the meat and acting you know, with all this freedom, what will it do to their potential faith? How will it injure them? And so he said, if that be the case, I'll not eat meat. Just not going to have nothing to do with it. I'm reminded of the time when Bob Jones was offered, or was invited, excuse me, he was invited to a uh, reception with the governor. And at that reception, there were a lot of important people in the state in which he lived. And all of them knew who Bob Jones was. They knew who he was. If you don't know who he was, he was a, a person that started uh, Bob Jones University. 
Bob Jones University has taken a lot of heat over the years because of some stands that they have actually made in accordance with, with the scriptures. Wanting to be in right relationship with God, they've made certain positions and certain stances and been criticized for it. At this meeting, there were a lot of people a lot of them were important people within the state, within government, within po high positions of authority and power. And Bob Jones was invited there to speak and to meet with those people. While there, someone came up to him and said, can I get you something to drink? And he said, no, that's okay, thank you. And they were concerned about him, and they said, you know, I can get you a glass of water. You, you know, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to have any of the uh, alcohol that we have here. And he said, no, I don't even want, I don't even want a glass of water. And they looked at him, and they said, why? And he said, because I want to avoid even the appearance of evil. People may not know what's in my glass. They might assume what is in my glass. So I am not going to drink at all so that I would not cause anyone to stumble. Now you might say, but Brother Steer, that is extreme. It might be. But you see how much love he had for those that were watching him. He wanted those that would watch him to see an example of Christ that would encourage them and build them up, not some that would give them a license to sin. Somebody could have said, yeah, well, I was at that meeting the other day and I saw Bob Jones. He was drinking with the rest of them. Paul knew he was right about this. He knew he was right about the idols. There's nothing simple about eating meat. Nothing wrong with it at all. But rather than trying to make the point, he wanted to make a difference instead. He didn't force them and say, he could have said, you know, Christians, I'm an apostle. I have this position of authority. I know all things. And I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong with eating meat. Go ahead and eat it all you want. No problem. But he didn't push that point of view. Instead, he was willing to limit the freedom that Christ gave him for the sake of others who either were not knowledgeable enough or not strong enough. Or maybe they were still in the position of trying to find out where their freedom was. What is Paul saying as we sum this up? He's saying, pay attention to how others interpret what you do. Pay attention to how they interpret what you do. Not for your own sake or your own reputation, but for the sake of the other person's development. The other person that is maybe still trying to find their way. Remember to build them up with lo love rather than puff them up with the knowledge that you have about how free we are. In another place, Paul said, I can do all things, but all things are not good for the situation. Keep in mind that building up the others will sometimes cause us to have to help others to understand that in Christ they're secure. You can't earn salvation. I had a discussion with somebody the other day and I, and I, I, I almost said to them, <laughs> I had to back, back, up, back up, I almost said to them, do you mean to tell me you still don't understand that salvation is free? Some people don't. They've not grown to that place yet. 
And they're not secure in Christ. And so we have to be caring and gentle with them as they find that security in Christ. If you have your elements, would you get them ready now? This communion is a symbol of our being in Christ. It's a symbol of us being alive in Him, being free in Him. But we don't use that freedom as a license to hurt other people. We don't use that freedom as a license to cause others to stumble. Remember, there are so many people that are developing in Christ. Younger people. They could be younger in age, or they could be younger just in their spiritual understanding. And they're watching those of, the, of us who are mature to see what our choices are. And it's up to us to set a good example and to be careful how we conduct ourselves and how we live our lives in front of others. Father God, we, we thank you for the sacrifice that you made. We thank you that because of you, Jesus Christ came to this earth and gave himself for us. His body was broken for us. His blood was spilled out so that we might both be forgiven, healed, delivered, and ultimately set free of all the bondages of this life. Give us the strength, Lord, to walk in freedom, but to not use that freedom in the wrong way. Help us to make good choices. Help us to choose things, Lord, in our lives that bring you honor and glory. And help us to remember that all that we do, Lord Jesus, we do in Christ. And we do for Christ. Thank you for our healing. Thank you for our forgiveness. As we eat and drink it today, Lord Jesus, we are reminded of your grace and your blessings. We are reminded of your love that surpasses all things. And we are truly grateful. In Jesus' name. Take and eat and drink in the name of the Lord. Praise God. Because of Christ, we have peace. That first peace is the peace between us and God. There is nothing between us. Christ has made us whole. And the second peace is the peace that he has made with all. If you have an ought with a brother or sister, forgive them. If you have an ought or a problem with someone else, let it go. Love one another. Find the ability to rise to that place where Christ lives in us, where Christ lives through us, and there is peace. Praise God. I pray that you'll have a good week. Be blessed. Call somebody up. Tell them you love them. Call someone up. Tell them that you forgive them. Call someone up. Tell them I miss you. Call somebody up and say, you know what? I thank God for you and your life. Be blessed. Go in peace and go with God.